In this video, I'd like to go through the schematic design for an ESC or electronic speed controller for brushless DC motors. I haven't quite finished the routing, so that's why we're gonna do the schematic in this first video and then a follow-up video, I'll show you how I route a high power board, high current board, such as this ESC. This is just an ESC test board, so for my purposes, this shouldn't be built into you know any drones or RC models, but rather something I can play around with to test out various algorithms, for example, field-oriented control and so forth. In this video, I'd like to show design considerations when designing and sizing, for example, MOSFETs, the feedback circuitry, microcontroller pinouts, and I've also included a USB high-speed peripheral, which I think is pretty cool. So let's get started. Thank you very much to Altium for sponsoring this video. I've used Altium Designer to design this ESC, and I'll show you some of the benefits of using Altium Designer. If you'd like to give Altium Designer a try for yourself, you can visit the link at altium.com forward slash yt forward slash Phil's lab and get yourself a free trial. Let's start off with the overview page of the schematic. So the project contains various schematic files and pages. One is power, one is microcontroller, and three phases. If you're not familiar with how an ESC works, I won't be going into too much detail in this video, and I'll leave some links in the description to detail out what an ESC does and how it works. This is more of a hardware and schematic design video. The first thing I wanted to think about with this ESC is what are the specifications. ESCs typically drive three-phase brushless DC motors, so BLDC for short, and you'll need to define some certain specifications. Typically, these are powered in drones with lithium polymer batteries, or LiPos for short, and they only exist in certain cell configurations. I wanted you know, a fairly low-power ESC, so some 3S or 4S, so three or four cell batteries, and that gives me the lowest voltage of 10.8 volts and the highest at 16.8 volts. I got these because one cell approximately when discharged is 3.6 volts and fully charged is 4.2 volts. So that's how I got these VCC numbers. The maximum current I'd like this ESC to be able to deliver is 15 amps, which is fairly reasonable for a smallish ESC. I also want voltage and current measurements per phase, Typically, you would only require voltage measurements per phase and maybe a single current measurement of the battery current. But if I do current measurements per phase, this enables advanced control methodologies, for example, field oriented control. As an additional goodie, because the microcontroller can handle this, I wanted to implement USB high speed, so at 480 megabits per second, which lets me stream a lot of this motor data or this control data back to a host PC, for example, for further processing. In Altium, I've then created this overview page which shows the various connections between these different schematic pages. One of these schematic pages contains a buck converter which steps down the battery voltage to 3.3 volts for the microcontroller and also senses the battery voltage with a potential divider. Then I have a microcontroller circuitry which has various ADCs for the current and voltage measurements but also has various timer channels or PWM channels to control the half bridges which we'll see in these phases, phases A, B, and C making up the three phases of the motor driver. Let's start off with the power section page. And essentially this is just taking the battery input voltage and then stepping it down to 3.3 volts. As usual, I'd like to keep my schematics you know, fairly clean. So I'll give them some sort of title, a number, maybe draw some bounding box and do some annotations as well as fill in this title block at the bottom right here. VCC is my battery input voltage and I'll use solder pads in the final PCB. And this is where my battery then connects to or my power source. You can see I've already annotated that the VCC is between 3S and 4S, and as I explained before, these are the number of cells in my battery. And the bottom I've just annotated what voltages these correspond to. So if I have a 3S battery, that goes anywhere from 10.8 to 12.6 volts. And if I have a 4S battery, that's 14.4 to 16.8 volts. So from completely discharged to fully charged. I have some TVS protection. I still want to choose the correct diode for this, you know, with working voltages, clamping voltages, and so on. And then I have this potential divider, which steps down my battery voltage, which could go up to 16.8 volts, as I indicated here. And to make sure this scales down to between zero and about three volts for my ADC measurements of my microcontroller. So I'm using this potential divider, as well as this C100 capacitor, which is 10 nanofarads, to make sure I limit my bandwidth. I can filter out some of the noise. BCC is then used to power my half bridge phases. But other than that, I do perform a small amount of filtering because all the switching we'll be doing, it's good to add some sort of pi filter before we feed that in to this buck converter, which then feeds the 3.3 volt circuitry, for example, microcontroller, USB phi, and so on. This, of course, requires some input capacitor, output capacitor, and various surrounding circuitry, for example, this inductor, bootstrap capacitor, and so forth. One interesting circuit design aspect is this enable signal, which has a high threshold 
or on threshold of 1.2 volts. And we can use this to our advantage. For example, when a three cell battery is pretty much depleted, so each of the cells are 3.6 volts, this gives me about 10.8 volts total battery voltage. And I can use that to then turn off the ESC to make sure the battery isn't further depleted, which could damage the battery. So I've chosen my resistor dividers here to turn off this buck regulator and thus in turn turn off the ESC once 10.8 volts are reached. This is a variable buck converter, so I need to supply some sort of feedback voltage and I do that with this potential divider and noting that my feedback voltage node is 0.8 volts and I want my output voltage to be 3.3 volts. And of course, some sort of on LED and making sure also to annotate all of my net names. This will be really useful when it comes to PCB design later on. That's all there is to this power section. Moving on, we have a slightly larger schematic page and it looks a bit overwhelming at first sight. This is the microcontroller, USB high-speed PHY, decoupling and serial wire debug connector. Let's go through one by one. At the top, we have the SCM32 F405 RGT6 microcontroller, which is one of my favorites. Really high powered, 168 megahertz, floating point unit, loads of peripherals. So really good for this kind of job where we might want to use more advanced algorithms like field-oriented control. I have USB full speed as a connector here with some ESD protection, various pinouts, which I'll show you how I did that in STM32 Cube IDE. I'm running a 24 megahertz crystal and I all have all of my power and decoupling over here. So per VDD pin, I have 100 nanofarads, got a bulk decoupling capacitor and some filtering on my VDDA, which essentially is the analog or reference section for my ADCs. Below that, you can see I have this serial wire debug connector, which is this tag connect header which I pretty much always put on my PCBs now. And this is this solderless head over here. And you need a special tag connect probe, but this saves essentially a part and a cost per board, which is really cool. I've included ESD protection, of course, and some sort of series current limiting resistors in case of any shorts on these lines. So anywhere where I have human interaction, where I have connectors, I will typically place some sort of protection, ESD protection, and so forth. Before we get to the pinout, I also have this USB high-speed PHY. The nice thing about this stm 32 f 4 microcontroller is that it has a ULPI interface, which is essentially a low pin count interface for USB high speed. The interface consists of eight data signals, so data zero to data seven, as well as various control signals, as NXT, STP, clock, and direction. Unfortunately, the pinout of the microcontroller isn't that great. The pins are spread around the package, so it isn't the nicest thing to root, but at least it has it. This file or this physical layer chip requires a, a clock as well, and it requires a 24 megahertz crystal. And this is the reason why I also chose a 24 megahertz crystal for my microcontroller. My microcontroller accepts various input frequencies. Just to keep my bill of materials count small, I can use the same part for Y200 and Y201. It's important to note that for the USB 5, according to the datasheet, we also need this feedback resistor to make the oscillator work, which is typically a one mega ohm resistor. The load capacitors, 10 picofarads, I've chosen depending on the crystal specification, which had a load capacitance of 9 picofarads. Other important parts of this physical layer are, of course, the decoupling. It requires a 3.3 volt input source, which we got also from the regulator, but it can generate its own 1.8 volt supply voltage on its own by using this reg enable pin, pin 31, and pulling that high. So we don't have to supply our own 1.8 volts, which is really nice. We also require a 1% 12K bias resistor, and that's about it. The rest are then connections to this micro USB connector over here, where you have a VBUS sense pin and the differential pair for USB. I just wanted device only, so this will, won't act as a host or won't be on the go, so that's why I leave my ID pin floating, and I also don't connect the shield since this is a device. Even though it looks fairly complicated, there's not much to connecting this USB high-speed PHY to the microcontroller. Regarding pinout, let's jump over to SCM32 Cube IDE. Here I now have the configuration window open for SCM32 Cube IDE. I've chosen my part and I have several videos detailing how to do the pinout and how to use SCM32 Cube IDE also for programming your device. Unfortunately, when using USB high speed, the pinout is pretty much fixed. So I can collect, select USB high speed by going to connectivity and then USB on the go high speed. And I just want a device only. And this will activate all of these on the go high speed pins. So all the ULPI pins, and these unfortunately are fixed, which means I have to work my pin out around these pins. I need several ADC channels. This is for voltage and current measurement. So I've enabled those. I've enabled my crystal or clock input, so to speak. And you can also see I have various decoupling points here for the power inputs and so forth. 
I have also enabled the full speed peripheral for USB. That's why I have two USB connectors, you know, in case my USB high speed doesn't work or if I want to separate control and data. So I could use full speed bus to control my device, maybe use some graphical user interface, and then I can stream data with my high speed interface, for example. I've also enabled my Serawa debug pins, including this trace output SWO, which lets me plot variables in real time. Other than that, I also, of course, need to control my gates or my, my gate drivers, which they'll then control the gates of these half bridges, which we'll see in just a second. So I've enabled timer one. If I go to the timer section on the left, click on timer one. And just for pinout, I haven't set up any of these peripherals properly. This is just to do my pinout. I've selected for channel one, PWM generation, channel one and channel one N. So they are basically out of phase and this is because how my gate drivers work, which we'll see in just a second. So I have one channel with a normal polarity and then I have another timer channel with an inverted polarity and I have three of those channels to drive my three phases. Then in my clock configuration, I've selected that my input frequency is 24 megahertz, as we saw because of the crystal. I'm using HSE and I'm using the PLL clock and I'm running at a maximum of 168 megahertz. And I've let STM32 cube IDE figure out all these PLL settings. So that's pretty much all there is to at least the pinout setup for this device. So you can see these various vSense, HIN, NLIN signals, and these will then go off to the phase pages. So I have three phases. I have the A phase, B phase, and C phase. And all of these A, B, and C phases are pretty much identical other than the names of the nets. And to me, this is the most interesting part of the design. This is the actual driver stage for my motor phases. So I have three phases, all identical, and they consist of certain aspects. The centerpiece, so to speak, are these transistors. These are two NVET transistors and very high current, very high power. These are the ones here, so you can see they go up to 60 amps, they've got a fairly low on resistance, gate source voltage up to 20 volts. When choosing these, I want to oversize them. I don't want to have them just be able to do 15 amps, which I've designed my ESC to. I want to have enough margin on my continuous drain current to make sure these things don't overheat. Another important factor is choosing a low RDS on because you know power is I squared R. So 15 amps going through this squared times 2.3 milliohms. You can see I'm losing about half a watt of power at full throttle, so to speak. And you know, half a watt is pretty okay. If we look at the data sheet, we can find more inf information as well. These can actually sustain pretty high currents depending on the temperatures and so forth. So might be overkill for this design, but I'd rather oversize my output devices to make sure you know, I don't overheat and I won't get any problems. So I have two of them configured in a half bridge configuration, and these need to be driven by a gate driver. I couldn't just simply connect up my timer channels to the gates of these transistors because first of all, these wouldn't turn on hard enough because the MCU voltage is only 3.3 volts. I need to pull these gate voltages very high, pretty much almost to the supply voltage to get these things to turn on fully and have minimum losses. Essentially, the gate of a FET looks somewhat like a capacitor. So if you're switching very fast, have very fast edges, I equals C dV by dt, you're going to get a lot of current actually flowing into the gate and the, this would pretty much destroy the microcontroller or wouldn't be able to supply it. So therefore you need this thing called a gate driver which can supply the current and also pull the gates up to a high enough voltage to turn these field effect transistors on. The device I went with is this IR2103. It can supply a certain amount of current. It has enough, it can supply a high enough voltage to the gates. The nice thing about these half bridge drivers, rather than making them yourself, so I could make my own half bridge driver, which has, you know, which consists of various transistors to pull up the gates and so forth. These will also include some sort of dead time circuitry to make sure there's minimum or no shoot through. For example, if both of these transistors happen to be on at the same time, so it tries to prevent that. This circuit from the data sheet, I've pretty much just taken over into Altium. I have my bootstrap diode, bootstrap capacitor, decoupling capacitor, and gate resistors over here. Same circuit pretty much directly in Altium. The reason we have gate resistors is to limit the current flowing through this path and through this path for both of these transistors. Typically 100 ohms is enough and I've made sure these are not 0402 but 0603 or larger value resistors because these will have to dissipate some, some power. I've also added some decoupling to VCC which will then go directly next to the transistors. Of course you can add more, it's 47 microfarads per phase, best to have just a bit more decoupling as well. We have, we've talked about the gate driver section, we've talked about these high power MOSFETs, next we want to look at the sensing circuitry. Essentially our phase output, at least for this phase, is V phase A, and this is what we connect to one of the motor phases at the end. I have again ESD protection, 
and then I have this feedback or sensing circuitry over here. We've seen this resistor divider before, and this was to sense the battery voltage, and I've used exactly the same component values. This will step down by phase voltage down to something that the ADC of the microcontroller can handle, so three volts maximum. And that's when we are using a full cell battery and we get 16.8 volts at the V phase A, we just get under three volts at V sense A. I've also included this capacitor again, of course, to filter out some of the high frequency content. So this limits my bandwidth to 19 kilohertz. And this sums up the voltage measurement of the phase, but we also would like to measure the current of the phase. And this is done with this circuitry, with this op amp looking device over here. You can see I have a shunt resistor connected through the path of these transistors, through the shunt resistor, and this is two milliohms. So very, very small resistance. And this is to make sure we don't dissipate too much power and that this resistor can actually handle that. If you think at 15 amps, I squared R is our power dissipation. So 15 squared times two milliohms gives me about 0.45 watts. So I've chosen this resistor to be one watt and I've listed the part number here to make sure we don't fry this thing when we get a maximum current going through this. Once we have a current going through this, essentially the phase current going through this re resistor, there'll be a voltage drop across it. Now, because we're using a two milliohm resistor, this is very low and we'll only get about 0.03 volts or 30 millivolts drop across this resistor. And if we feed that straight into the ADC, you know, even with 12 bits resolution, you won't read anything. So what we need to do is amplify that signal. So scale 30 millivolts to something like three volts. So we need a gain of 100. And this is exactly what this device does. This is the INA180, and it comes in various flavors and various gain options. I've chosen an A3 device, which is 100 volts per volt. So a gain of 100. So if we have a voltage drop of 0.3 volts times 100, we get three volts of the output, which is perfect to feed into the ADC at maximum current. So this is a linear mapping, essentially. We could, of course, just use a different amplifier instead of this current sense amplifier, but this contains everything in one package. You can see we don't have all of these resistors we need to feed around and so forth. So it's much simpler to use one of these current sense amplifiers, and they're pretty cheap anyway. Things to look out for are the bandwidth of the device. So current measurements, we typically want a higher bandwidth than voltage measurements. We want to make sure we have the right gain and also the right common mode input voltage range. We want to make sure this can handle, you know, a full cell battery voltage at the input terminals, which it can. It goes up to 26 volts. So once we've measured our current voltage essentially across this resistor, we amplify it with a gain of 100. Don't forget your decoupling capacitor. And then I also provide some sort of filtering to limit the bandwidth. And this is chosen at out 160 kilohertz, and we can play around with C304 or R303 to then reduce the bandwidth even more. And then that feeds into an ADC channel of the microcontroller. So you can see actually a very simple ESC design and a lot of commercial ESCs will just contain this circuitry, the microcontroller we saw, you know, minus the USB high-speed physical layer and so on. But this is all you would need, that is with three phases, so A, B, and C, to make your own ESC. So in future videos, I would then like to, once I've finished the layout and routing of this ESC, this is going to be a six layer board to handle all the current and all the signals. I'd like to go through how do you actually route and lay out an ESC. And then how do we also write the algorithm to control or very simple algorithm to control our ESC, to control our brushless DC motor. So thank you very much for watching this video. If you haven't already, please do leave a like and comment and subscribe if you're new to this channel. I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Thank you.